Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the What Did He Said podcast. It's your boy Chingo Bling. Uh, producer Rob got some stuff to take care of, man. But hey, right now we got the lunatics running the insane asylum. We got uh, Israel Garcia is playing producer today, so he doesn't have a mic. Uh, man, it's good to be back, bro. We got Juan Perez in the building. What's up? What's up? Uh, again, Javi Luna, he, he can't be here. He's normally... Slade is like, yo, am I the guinea pig for the B team? What's going on? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my man. Slade Ham, Whiskey Brothers. My man has produced over a thousand podcasts. He's been doing comedy in about 78 countries. Wrote a book. He got a comedy special. You got to give us the rundown on all man. the stats, bro. When you say it that way, I yeah, sound. Yeah, it's like <laughs> over a thousand <laughs> Easily way over a thousand it. podcasts. Well, because we did the Whiskey Brothers is already we're clocking almost eleven hundred episodes. I'm pushing, you know, the first century of episodes on my solo podcast. Like it's, I guess I've been behind. You already on the first one hundred? On uh, nah, but I'm pushing fifty. It's the, uh, the it, it, as soon as I cross fifty, I'll be on my way to a hundred. And it feels like it's one of those things. I gave myself like an accountability podcast like I, w I felt myself being in the middle of projects and wasn't okay i don't really have anything that's gonna make me check in every day so this has turned into that it's like man i gotta show up every week mm -hmm. like it or not want to or not tired or not yeah. because man we're self we're self-employed is yeah. if i don't if i don't set my alarm for myself nobody's gonna knock on the door and check on me yeah, <laughs> so yeah. No, but, but you're like great at talking you know what I mean? In terms of like, like I can hear you doing radio. I, that's sort of where I come from. Like that's, I yeah. was doing radio before I was doing comedy, you know, and just rock radio. It's not like I was talking a lot, but that's sort of writing for what I was going to say in between songs. And this was back in, you figure the mid nineties, K106, 94.1, the station's out of Beaumont, Texas. Uh, so it's not a big market. It's mm -hmm. a 126th radio market. We're down there. We know what we are. We're terrible. And that's counting all the little terrible cities around it. You, it's you, a you terrible do your, uh, your morning shout out like Port Arthur, Orange. Yes. Yes. Rider. Absolutely. <laughs> At 100, we call it the dark place. We don't. <laughs> the dark, <laughs> that's but that's the, the, the best place to grow, though, because if you go to the smaller markets, it, it gives you a lot of room to freaking improve because it's only up. It's you only really, up uh, you really yeah. do have nowhere to go. It's yeah. uh, <laughs> And you're also big fish in a small pond. And so I was kind of doing radio and then when I started moonlighting in comedy but all of that was writing to fill in those little spaces in between songs and then you're like well I guess I got a notebook full of stuff I'll take that to the stage and, and then and the stage leads back to in that weird circular way hey podcasting's now a thing you're like I guess I'm just never gonna get out of any of this so <laughs> like 23 years of stand-up I started in April of 2000 when right. I yeah it's it feels like the the 2000s did a weird thing with our brains, right? We knew what the 70s were. We knew what the 80s were. We knew what the 90s were. And then everything after 2000 to me is just like one big decade. And that's I don't really make the separation. So in my head, I'm just like 2000 anything is yesterday. And then I do the math and I'm like, dear God, I started stand up 23 years ago. There's kids doing stand up who weren't alive when I started doing stand up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. You, I yeah. know it's like 9-11. It's very it's all wait, you weren't around for that. You're not a real person. How could you be doing stand up? You don't have anything to say. Have no opinions. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's like a. What is it, like a watershed? Like, it's mm -hmm. just, Water, yeah, watershed event. That's one of those things where it's like, that's a very good point. Like, there's so many ways to critique um, a super young stand up comedian. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, there's just so many angles. Like, but that that's one where it's like, bro, you you ain't you ain't even seen nine eleven, bro. Like, well, it's stand because stand and again, I'm not. I refuse to be the grumpy old man complaining yeah. about the young kids. It's yeah. I won't be that get off my lawn. Yeah, dude. back in right. my day, you gotta. I started there. I was that age when I started. I, I still am. I'm a white it's, belt. It's <laughs> it will comedically, but like just humanly, right? When you're early twenties, you don't because comedy is about back this all up. Comedy's about finding. The differences in between things we think are similar and finding the similarities in between the things we think are different. That's really at the core what a lot of comedy is. Mm -hmm. Blowing things up into a million parts and then finding out how they shuffle back together and overlay. Like right? pattern recognition. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Finding the commonalities in things. And, and things that are opposites and mm -hmm. irony. But you have to have experience in the world to have a database of things to compare. 
if you're 21 and you've never left your hometown, you only have honestly like five or six points of reference in your whole dumb little life by which to compare all these new ideas. And that's the that's my only critique of youth is you just haven't done enough to know what you're comparing stuff to yet. I'm mm -hmm. 46, about to be 47. I've, you meant, however many countries I've been to, mm -hmm. six continents, 60 countries, it's all, that gives me, st and I'm not saying it makes me better, but it certainly gives me a lot more points of reference mm -hmm. to start thinking about things. Oh, that reminds me of, mm -hmm. you can't complete that sentence if you don't have stuff for it to remind you. Yeah, the youngsters, man, ain't never got their heart broke. No! Ain't never been through some shit. Ain't never had a homie backstab you. <laughs> Listen, man, till you've been pushed off a balcony and stabbed by a girl, you don't know what love is. <laughs> like, you yeah, you've run. been hung over once. That's, like, you don't yes. even, you ain't got no stories to tell. Dude, I, I listen to people tell me stories now of me. And I'm, I'll be halfway through the story listening, like, intently, like, waiting to see what happens. And then they'll be like, remember that? And I'll be like, oh, that was me? No, I don't remember yeah. that. <laughs> we did 56 shots of Jack Daniels at the House of Blues that night? No, I don't remember that. But it's a good story. Yeah. Speaking of House of Blues, tour dates. Uh, we have Waco, Texas coming up Ooh. May 20th. Uh, Houston, Texas, House of Blues, June 16th. Uh, but check out my website, man. We got like Oklahoma City and Chicago and a bunch of other cool places. San Antonio. We're going everywhere. Get you so, theater tour. No, oh, no, no. It's not. It's not a the theater Shameless tour plug. yet, man. This is this is me just trying to turn up, man. Because all the curveballs in life and all the problems and everything, like, ain't no way around it. But to turn all the way up. Uh, and shout out to our sponsors, man. I'm gonna be signing bottles of pie tequila June 10th. My wife gave it away on Cafecito Time Live yesterday. She's like, oh, he's going to be at a Specs. I'm like, damn, woman, I was trying to make them guess, like <laughs> H-E-B, like Stripes or whoever. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, yeah, we're going to be at a Specs. We'll tell you which one, June 10th, uh, leading up. I'm trying to be like Ed Sheeran, bro. Like when they got a, a drop, mm -hmm. Ed Sheeran be out there, bro. He might hop on top of an ice cream truck yeah. in New York. You try to be the hundreds. Man, Look I'm trying, you. bro. Like I can't even get a vlog done in time. And we over here trying to be 43-year-old uh, content creators. Mm -hmm. But uh, shout out to my lawyer. And shout out to uh, all the people that, that are angels that uh, you know step into your life. But no, man, it, it, we have so much to talk about. I just couldn't forget about the sponsors making it happen because since you mentioned house of blues but dude we have so much to talk about man um thanks for having me on your podcast several times when you first it was we got to be friends when you first started stand up well israel just israel garcia just asked me that he's like man how you know slate him and i was like dude i can't remember the exact time i was like but i was early in my stand -up. somewhere when you first started you were coming out and hitting open mics and okay. i mean it was and that was i think one of the most that's kind of what made me respect what you were doing because i'm just watching from a distance you were right? in the back eating pasta like hey. <laughs> <laughs> let me talk to him hey. <laughs> because you know is you've been when i've been doing comedy as long as i have i come in the back i'm watching young comics on stage i'm watching new i'm just looking for faces i don't recognize i'm looking to laugh at my old friends that's what i'm in the club for and then to know your name and it's, you instantly just kind of I, I go, man, another one of these dudes trying to laterally move. You know what I mean? Just stay in your lane, bro. Just do what you do. Why are you coming over here like every actor and every other musician I, and like, everybody Chico else? Bling. Come on, man. Who thinks stand up <laughs> is something you can just move to yeah. without doing any real work. Like it's something you can just slip into. And what I respected the most was you came in and just were legitimately open micing it. Not, oh, yeah. hey, here's Bomb. what I, I came from this and I got a million this or that. Nah. Give me time and attention. You came in and were like, hey, Bombing. I'm the new <laughs> dude in the room. Yeah. I, everybody in this place has seniority over. Give me my spot. Let me do my thing. And you hustled your way back up that, like up into that, that group that is it's like this it's like in the jujitsu world man some people out there buying a blue bells bro mm -hmm. some people out there buying stripes big dog mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying i might be a white belt with two stripes but i earn my two stripes big <laughs> you sub substantially pass white belt but, but that is a thing about like 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 juan and i we be having these stand-up comedy conversations because we be on these road trips and stuff and in and out of hotels air airplanes and stuff and we have these like philosophical comedic combos but one one really good gem, I think, is, for example, when I was having a private lesson, I'm talking about two black belts <laughs> out there in El Paso, and I'm talking about 
real deal black belts, not no bought off Amazon black belt. <laughs> and one of the things one of the gentlemen told me was like, he's like, you good, bro. He was like, you at the beginning of your journey. Not you're good, you know what you're doing, but like hang in there and it's got to be in you, not on you. Kind of like, kind of like the pimp game type of thing. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like, but that's the example for a comedian. I think that's a good uh, advice for for an up and coming comic because it's one of those things where it's like you can't be in it for certain things because even when the success does come, you're gonna be tested in a lot of ways. Like that's when sometimes you really got to turn your focus on. Mm-hmm. And I'll give you an example, man. Uh, Rap Barboza, a very a big fan. Big, yeah, he, he's the man. And um, he recently posted a picture. Well, he had mentioned, like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm dabbling a little bit of boxing, you know, because, you know, from my big homie perspective, dude, hearing that, I'm like, bro, you don't understand how excited I am to see you be, like, so young, really at a big point in your career. And I was like, this is just one of those smart decisions mm-hmm. where it's going to keep you focused. It's challenge. It's challenging. You're inspiring other kids. You're keeping your mind off of all this BS. Well, you need you need discipline, too. And Ralph's a young comic. Keyword. Ralph is Ralph's one of these. He featured for me in Dallas a year or two ago, right before everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah same. Yeah, yeah, same. And he's out there McCallum with us. Like. One of those who I also we worked together. I think we were together with Taylor, somebody at uh, the improv and He was hosting and I was middling and it was one of those, the kid was legitimately curious about comedy, like asking real questions. And there's a big difference between those dudes who are just hobbyists, like we were talking about earlier, and the dudes who are really legitimately trying to approach this as a career and how do I get better and how do I build a skill set and how do I figure out some of the problems I have. And some of the way you do that is what you were alluding to earlier. Is you got to live this. Mm-hmm. If you're going to do stand-up, I believe this wholeheartedly, and you can sub stand-up out for any art mm-hmm. you want to make it, mm-hmm. right? I don't care if you're a podcaster yeah. or you're a painter or you're a baker or you're an entrepreneur, whatever mm-hmm. that is. Mm-hmm. The You don't have any control over what your shit does when it leaves your house, right? It doesn't matter what I make, what podcasts I do, what special I produce, what anything I'm involved with. Once I shove it out of the nest, it's gone. The world may love it. The world may hate it. I don't have any control over that. So if I'm tied to what happens to it once it gets out there, I'm fucked. Mm -hmm. I don't have a because now my happiness is not internal. This is due to whatever someone else decides. So the process of making all this stuff is what you have to love. That's why when I see painters, I have friends who paint like I just got to figure out how to monetize this. No, you don't. Mm -hmm. That is something that will happen or won't happen. You can certainly do your part to make it happen. But you have to wake mm-hmm. up and paint because you have to wake up and paint. Mm-hmm. Like that's the this special I'm making, the mm-hmm. Kickstarter I'm running isn't mm-hmm. because, oh, I need to figure out how to finance next year. It's happening because if I don't get this hour out of my head, mm-hmm. it's going to come out somewhere. Mm-hmm. And that's I don't want it to be on the dude at the stoplight or on yeah. some stranger. I need to get comedy out of my brain and into the world. So whatever happens from there isn't isn't connected to the money or the success or the eyeballs in the social media world how much how many views you're getting or how many likes you're getting or how many retweets or posts or shares if we're attached to all of that you don't have a chance you got to be in this because mm-hmm. you're in it mm-hmm. who cares about you yes i'm gonna make errors i'm learning i'm trying to figure this out this is all the stuff i gotta do on yeah. the way to whatever the top of that mountain is exactly and it's you just gotta sit in that, that that's like actors that when they do auditions you can't be married to that performance and that one opportunity, that one role. It's like you got to get ready to be disciplined and consistent Mm -hmm. for the next audition. Uh, For example, um, some of the uh, agents from the Thea, we have the Discord for the the, the podcast supporters and the Patreon. You helped me set that up. Uh And um, so some of the patrons were saying like, yo, cafecito time with your wife, that's getting more views. You know what I mean? Like that's, Mm -hmm. that's where the views are type of thing. And my, they were like, you know, what's the plan with that? You know, da, da, da. And I, same example, I mean, same answer, which was like, we're just going to have to decide if it's something we like to do, where we're going to have to be consistent and put in more energy into the output or the input or whatever. The things we can control, mm-hmm. not like, I'm just going to, you know, figure out how we're going to monetize this shit. Well, you have you have to, to figure out what part of it you really like, right? Like, I think a lot of content creators get into this because we see 
this glamorous side of it, right? We see all the people getting all the views and all the money, and they because we're watching them in under 60 second clips, we don't see any of the rest of their lives. No one sees how actually difficult creating things is. So it's if you're gonna throw yourself into what is arguably a more intense, more time uh, intense job than anything else you could go do, you better do something you like. If you don't ultimately like being on the other side of this microphone, you're, you're never gonna sustain it. If you're sitting down and looking at, if you've got three different things going out to the public, right? I do this podcast, this podcast, and this podcast. Well, this one over here is getting all the numbers. This one over here, I really, really love. Well, you kind of have to make some decisions mm -hmm. because yeah, that financial side is mm -hmm. gonna give you a quick right now but this is the one you're still gonna wanna do in three years. Mm -hmm. And that's as we're trying to design our careers and figure it all out. They're very important questions to ask. Like mm -hmm. ultimately, what do I like doing? Because if you don't like working on standup, if you don't like writing standup, if you don't like watching tapes of yourself and figuring out where you went wrong and what you could do better and thinking about your stage presence and how to read it, if you're not willing to do all of that, then you should honestly talk to yourself about what you want to do with the rest of your life. Because yeah. maybe this ain't it. Wait, what'd you name the special? Sorry. No, you're good. So uh, I'm right now, Signal to Noise. is Signal the, to Noise. Yes. It's okay. the ratio uh, between the two mm -hmm. and sort of how we're living in this this time and place where I don't think we're we're physically cut out for the world we're living in. I think if you look evolutionarily, right, back to our hunter-gatherer ancestors on the plains, they evolved to process a certain amount of information, our way of parsing all this shit that comes at us. And they landed on the fact that they could really take in and pay attention to about six or seven things. That's the human capacity. And that was them 10,000 years ago, and that's still us now, because we don't evolve that quickly. The difference is, back then, five or six things, you're paying attention. That's how you kept the tiger from eating your baby, right? Because mm -hmm. we're sitting around the village, mm -hmm. looking at my friends and yeah. family. I can pay attention to him and I can pay attention to him and the cook fire over here. Yeah. My baby's one of those things and the rattle yeah. in the bushes and past that, yeah. if I pay attention to too much, that tiger will just run in and eat my baby. And I can't do anything mm -hmm. about it because I got distracted. Yeah. And if I pay attention to less than that, oh, I'm just gonna stare into the cook fire and not really pay attention yeah. to anything. Tiger's also gonna eat your baby. That's our sweet spot. Now, 2023, think about how much stuff is getting thrown at your face every noise. single day. You, it's all noise, Chingo, yeah. every last bit of it. I sat at one of the ALDS games at, at Minute Maid Park at the end of last year. And it was, it was the game where we, we won at the very end, but we were so slow and miserable and we were lo the Astros were losing the whole game. So I'm bored out of my brain. I decided to count how many ads I could see just from where I was sitting. And I got to 102, just, just where I was sitting, just 102 pieces of information being flung at my face. Yes, noise. It's all noise. So it's kind of how do we keep the tiger from eating our, our metaphorical baby in this day and age? And I'm just I'm exploring that, and I think it's, uh, it's all really coming out on stage. So when I do this special, that's going to be a, a good core chunk of the middle of it. Interesting. I'm fascinated by it how uh unprepared we are for this environment <laughs> yeah that's deep man that, that's how you know you've been in comedy for a long time when you start to like take on take on those uh daunting subjects and peeling back all those layers you know? and without being I, without being polarizing about it i think is kind of my intent with this is i don't want to i don't want to instantly separate because i don't know what i believe the yeah. truth is, I honest, I'm so mercurial in my beliefs right now. I'm kind of, every time I settle into something, I'm like, well, I know how many times I've changed in the past, so let me just mm -hmm. loosely hang on yeah. to whatever this thing is. So as I approach the special, it's, it's kind of nice to be looking at it as a mature stand-up instead of just going, well, I got an hour's worth of disconnected jokes. Let me go tell them in some order and record it which is how I've always thought in the past, mm -hmm. right? I just got a bunch of jokes. Let's tell them. This is more, man, I want to say something. I want to start somewhere. I want to chisel through a few points. I want to go somewhere else. And it's not like I'm doing some TED Talk. Mm -hmm. It's all. It's still the same funny stories I've been telling from my life. It's nice. still the same me I've been on stage. I've just... I've kind of focused the laser one direction, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's it's really lit me up more creatively than I ever have before because I'm looking for... I think before I was kind of looking at stand up in this 
well, there's so much funny stuff out there. Let me just catch what comes to me. And now I'm in this place of, no, I'm looking for very specific things. I'm writing for this and I'm writing for this. And this is, I got to make this point in here. So let me really dig in. And that's been, I think it's like, it woke me up again. Instead, I got real complacent for a few years. Oh, shit, that's interesting. Now I'm like, oh, wait, I'm writing with purpose. And then those are the ones that actually stick out. And those are the ones that actually like transcend time and everything is like i mean that's what really happened with like george carlin and stuff is like when he was just doing jokes to do jokes and all of a sudden he it just he flipped the switch and all of a sudden now he's actually saying stuff with so much substance yeah like, you you find like, you find what it is i mean you can't help it right you talk about finding patterns and stuff mm-hmm. like that you can't look at your life over 23 years and not find some overlapping circles and some patterns and some commonalities that you might not even been aware of up front, but you're like, Oh no, that's turns out that is who I am. That's what I've, that's what I've been angling towards for 20 years. So both of y'all both came from, from radio to comedy and, and things like that. Did y'all, cause there's only a, like, there's a few that I could think of like y'all like Ali Sadiq mm-hmm. kind of thing. Did y'all's comedy fuel the radio? Like did radio come along because because it was like, oh man, I I can like get closer to comedy through radio, or was it like radio? Did radio kind of fuel the comedy? So yeah, I'll let you answer first. Sure. Yeah. I mean, honestly, bro, when I was doing radio in college, I was trying to figure out everything. Like I, case in point, I didn't know shit. <laughs> so I was trying to navigate, uh, like DJing, producing a show, like talking on a microphone like yeah. i was having to navigate all that to where there were probably some times where like oh that was actually pretty funny like yo like you're, you're actually pretty funny you know yeah there might have been some of those instances but i was basically all i had for points of reference was my little limited uh life at the time just as a broke college student and and trying to figure out how i was gonna entertain people that were listening uh, but yeah, looking back, there were probably some, um, s- not signs, but like, oh, I don't know if you know, but you're kind of thinking like a stand up right there or like, oh, I don't know if you know, dude, but that's your sense of humor. You know what I mean? Yeah. You have, well, you get an opportunity to, to, f- to showcase what, whatever is in your head. That radio is this loud broadcast system for, for knuckleheads like us. Like I yeah. should, I was 20 years old. I was, what was I doing on the radio? What did you think uh, I had to, yeah. you know, or 21, yeah. whatever. What did you think I was going to say? Like I, I, cause that's, that's what it comes. And I was doing for me, I, it's kind of been this pinball wall jump from stand up to radio to stand up to radio. So in seventh or eighth grade, I was getting out of fights by, by being the, your mama kid. I had all the jokes. I had them all. I could snap with the best of them. You, time to raw. Let's go. I knew what I was doing. And to to sort of see that that library of jokes, I was listening to all the stand up I could. I was watching stuff. I was getting up and turning the TV on at ten o'clock at night when the family's in bed, listening to A and E's Evening at the Improv on one, and writing all this down. I'm doing this in seventh and eighth grade and into high school, not with the intention of doing stand up at all. Mm-hmm. Just it's a survival yeah, mechanism. It's working. Yeah, <laughs> it's a tool I've got. It's the yeah. only tool I got. I'm a clueless yeah, kid. Have a big mouth. Yeah. yeah, growing up, man, my mom's a single parent raising four boys on a school teacher's salary. Yeah. I'm basically latch can it in the afternoons. I'm trying to not get in fights at school. I don't care about any of this. The only thing that's working for me is I'm witty. That's all I got. So you hang on to that. I found something that works in this crazy world. And then radio became this thing. Well, in Beaumont, in this small town, you're yeah. looking up and you're like, what's what has any meaning here? I, everybody gets married or goes to work at the plant or disappears off to college, and I ha- I'm not old enough for anybody to have come back yet. So it's just this, they leave to the plants, they leave to college. What do I do? Yeah. And I've got this one skill, and radio looks sexy. I'm hearing the guys do the top eight at eight, and I end up get I charm my way into a, a Rick D's board ops position where I'm just playing the CD on Sunday mornings for 94.1. I go in put the CD in, wait 15 minutes, <laughs> run the commercials, chain smoke cigarettes, leave it 10. Like, it's terrible, right? Yeah. I'm not on the radio. I'm just at the radio yeah. station. and But I was breaking in to the production room. I had this little MacGyver knife <laughs> and the little Swiss Army <laughs> knife, and you could pop that one little that one little tool out that nobody really knows what it is, but MacGyver used to pick yeah, locks yeah, with yeah. that shit. So I 
took it up to the station one day and I wedged it in and realized I could pick the lock on this little production room door. And I started making air checks and sending them to the station, the rock station across town because they needed air checks and I wasn't on the air. Which so is like a demo tape, right? Yeah, it's an air check for the uninitiated is basically what you sound like talking over music and hitting what's called the post right when the vocals come in. So I would turn, I would make it, I was recording like a demo like I was on the air. And this is before everybody right now is like, well, that's simple. You just do that on your phone. Listen, one, phones you had to pick up and turn dials. This was a thousand years ago. And we didn't have the tech. There was no... There was no, I mean, you were on old school eight track recorders and tape and reel to reel. So I'm manufacturing this air check and then sending it every week, one over to the, the other station. And they finally hired me. <laughs> they were like, yeah, you still want to be on the radio? I'm like, yeah. They're like, you start at midnight. I'm like, oh, oh my God. Yeah. That, and that's amazing. Real quick, cut you off. That's amazing because <laughs> normally, the, like he just said, technology wise, normally the only people who are able to put together an air check is if you were already working at a station yeah. and you trying to move to another market or a bigger market or something. But like he said, they didn't have apps and software to like for compression, like to get your voice over to music to sound the way radio sounds there. Radio has like the compressors and oh, yeah. all that shit back then. There was, I mean, Pro Tools hadn't even came out. No, GarageBand, no, no. You no didn't, kind of apps and software. You couldn't and, even digitally record. It was. I remember when we came, when I moved over to the uh, rock station for that gig. They had the first automated computer system, and this it was Scott Studios, and basically the songs would autoplay. You could start or stop it. It was all digital, but. At, at uh, 94, we were still spinning CDs and physical, like, eight-track carts for the commercials. And the recording process was there were no there was no digital multi-track anything. Like, now you turn on Adobe Audition or Audacity or any Pro Tool, any number of these. Just click record, and everybody shows up magically through their digital inputs. This is all hardwired into a board, which is run to a reel-to-reel. -reel. And when, you, when they, they we were cutting and splicing, was actual cutting with a razor blade and taping tape back together. So to put all this together in a meaningful way, because it wasn't like I got all these in a row where you just digitally cut and paste, I would make all this and then send it every week. So it was a, ultimately it looks like I was showing tenacity. The truth was I was doing what I did very well for the better part of a decade, which was do more work than any human could imagine possible in an attempt to get out of having to work. That was yeah. what I was good at. <laughs> bro, I work 80 hours a week to keep from having to work 20 hours a week. Bro, that's me. <laughs> that's been me since college. But you, there's a point for me where everything sort of shifted in those early radio days to answer your question a million years later. Mm -hmm. I wasn't doing it because I was working towards stand-up. I wasn't working towards anything. I was just sort of working towards not having to do anything. Radio is this blissful way for me to make enough money to maybe go to college. I don't know what I'm doing. I literally don't know. So it, it wasn't it wasn't like I, it just ended up being accident, accidentally. Maybe accidental is not the right word, but accidentally important to what I was going to do with comedy later. And I think that's because for a long time to, I wasn't – Picking a place and going towards it. I was looking at what was at my disposal and going, what can I make out of this? And for that reason, radio probably had more input as to why I became a stand up just for that reason. Well, this, these are the skills I got, and this is what's interesting to me. Hey, bro, you know what's interesting uh, is every time Slade and Chingle Bling link up there's always some kind of weed involved <laughs> <laughs> How about the, let me give you a couple quick stories <laughs> so slade and uh, joey diaz go way back oh yes uh, and i'm a big joey diaz fan mm -hmm. and uh, joey joey was gonna be at the improv and I, i'm like like this is how you know i'm a fan fan where it's like i'm like oh my god i'm gonna take some weed to joey diaz you know what i mean like i ain't even <laughs> had that much weed at the time but i'm like man he's gonna get mad if i only give him this much and he probably ain't gonna smoke it because he don't smoke fan weed <laughs> and uh so i'm like am i about to waste all this weed so anyway i guess slade was featuring for him and i'm all slade slade <laughs> slade you know he's like oh shit what's up she goes like hey man uh hey man this for you and joey man you know he, 
it's, it's pretty loud, man. You know, let, let them know Chingo sent you, you know, or something <laughs> like just being a giddy fan. Yep. And he's like, yeah, all right, motherfucker, I'll see if it makes it to him. <laughs> and then uh, Slade got me involved with this opportunity to be in a, um, it was basically like a pilot called mm -hmm. Just a Bit, which they're actually pitching it right now. There's yep. a lot of really good inroads for that. Uh, Adam was just here like the other day picking up some files because he's got a big sales presentation. Adam Taylor is so fantastic. Super hardworking dude. Uh, so, so Slade hooked me up with Adam and, and, um, and Rob and this really cool show called just a bit. You're going to hear more about that real soon. But, uh, as we were watching like one of the premiere screenings, uh, it was like they rented a small theater and we did some stand up leading up to it. And then it's like it was, night. yeah, it was fun. Then it was time to press play. And Slade's like, hey, man, you know what make the next 30 minutes way more interesting? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, we stepping outside, you know? So we're, like, playing hooky out there. Like, yeah, man, I appreciate you putting me in this show. <laughs> Next thing you know, we're coming back in, like, the little Oh, it's over, huh? <laughs> But it yeah, was great. Which certainly it was it was the stand up show well, was better off and that we waited. <laughs> what do you mean waited? Then? That we did that we the next thirty minutes oh, ended up yeah, after yeah, the yeah. stand up show. Otherwise that would have been the worst thirty minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm terrible and, at stand up uh, that way. Jerry 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 Wayne Longmore Jerry hosted Wayne. that show. Jerry Wayne was on the show and you helped produce his special mm -hmm. as well, Craig. It's a I, man, I th I think this is true, right? In stand up. You find you find a tribe. You find the one that you find early on when you first start, which is generally just made up of the people that are around you. And then later on, you kind of pick and show, all right, well, some of these people aren't going to make it and some of these <laughs> new people. You know what I mean? Like, we tried. I'm always <laughs> sure. I'm always going to be here for you, but not not for this. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then you you replace those and you get, you get a better group of people that take you through another chunk of your career or life. And then once you have, we should always be – evaluating that like there should be employee evaluations for sure for the five people you're closest to right some of them's family some of them you're stuck with i get that but we should be a little intentional about the five people around us and jerry's one of those guys he's in my five right now and it's a lot of that is the same drive that got you out there realizing that there's no way to get back into stand-up or get into stand-up period without actually running the course mm -hmm. there is no there's no secret trap door Jerry Wayne did stand up way back. He started a little bit after I did mm -hmm. and then took this massive break, right? Because life, life gets yeah. you. Hey, I'm going to go try to do a job and a family and all this stuff. And the family he still kept. But I think just the same way it would bother any of us, keeps poking at you. Hey, man, you were good at this. Hey, man, you're creative. Hey, why are you working on transmissions? Hey, yeah. why are you building houses? Hey, get back out there. And he came back out and went through. He ran the gauntlet. Just open mics, didn't tell anybody, hey, I won Houston's Funniest, didn't say, hey, I'm from here. He just, hey, put me on the list. Mm -hmm. So that work ethic attracts me. That's what I see out there. And I go, okay, if we were to do something together, I wouldn't just have to do everything. I would be able to share that we would create something. So he's sitting there, him and Adam are kind of talking about how that special is going to go down. Mm -hmm. And there was an opportunity for me because he didn't have an editor yet. So I got to step in. And kind of take the reins. All right, here's what you were going to do. Here's what I can bring to the table. And I think the finished product is so much better because it's a collabor it's a collaborative event. It, I didn't have to do it all. He didn't have to do it all. We did what we're best at. And it came out great. Um, mm -hmm. And that sort of, you know, is exactly what led to Andy's special. That's what's leading to my special. It's just a, it's a cool thing that happens when you put the right people around you and and sort of build stuff together was that the first one you produced so i did i produced the i executive produced the whiskey brothers special in 2015 but i wasn't as hands-on with it at all mm -hmm. uh, i had a fantastic director in chance mclean had a cinematographer and rob neal so like the team that was shooting that and making that and editing it one i didn't know anything about it to begin with i wouldn't have known how to edit i didn't know film production um I only had input. Hey, send me the. Here's what we got. Let's let's tighten this bit up. Let's. So but I'm. You got to see how it works. Yeah, and that's the. That's that the was the. Thing. And then you just kind of took from it, like I'm gonna. A hundred percent. This this yeah. this slow process of all right. I'm gonna get in the room as much as they'll let me for the editing or the this or the that, and I want to see the set. I'm just gonna soak. I'm just gonna watch this movie the first time. Just see what what all the moving parts are. And then the second time, I'm going to sit down with the movie that is making a comedy special, mm -hmm. and I'm going to dissect it. I'm going to look at the scenes and the directorial stuff. How did all this go down? 
And you take all those pieces and try to apply them to something like Jerry's. And then you take everything you learned with Jerry's. And what was different about Jerry's was I sat, not just sat in the editing bay, I was the editing bay. Like I full blown every frame in that special I picked. Like I chose, the, when you're that in the guts of it, you learn all sorts of stuff. Oh, I didn't know I could do this. I didn't know I could take two things that happen four minutes apart and make a cut out two minutes of that and make it look and here's what we can do and here's how this can work. And I had Trey Tutson, another great Houston comic mm -hmm. in the Bay with me. He was helping me edit. So by the time I was done with that, it's like, oh, there's 10 different skills now that I didn't have with the Whiskey Brothers and I didn't have them with Jerry's and I didn't have them with Ant. Now I've got all those and I know going into mine, there's still stuff I'm clueless about, but all these specials allowed me to have conversations with bigger people than me. My friend Jordan Brady, who's directed a ton of comedy. Um, I Am Battle Comic was the film I was in, but he's the dude who did I Am Comic, and he did Maria Bamford's special. He's done some cool stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to pick his brain, and then I had a long phone conversation with Barry Katz. Who, oh, no shit. Oh, shit. Yeah, executive creator of Last Comic Standing and executive producer of I don't know how many comedy specials. Oh, you have to be undeniable. Uh, all of the, uh, yeah. like, the who's who he's, comedian. He's a, and I told Kevin Hart, Kevin, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have impression. to be undeniable. So <laughs> that's that's him. So to, we had a half hour conversation about Andy's special, and he's looking at some things he can do with Andy in the future, and that's what prompted Say Andy's last name? Andy Huggins. There it is. So uh, the, the legendary, we've been dancing around Texas it. Outlaw, yeah. One of the original Outlaw comics, 74 years old. He's been doing stand-up for 45 years. It, like for literally my whole and, life, the so conversations I'm having about these young bucks, he's having about me. And been murdering that whole time. And a straight killer. So to have one, not is that that being the property, right? That's what I'm dealing with. It's I'm restoring a Mona Lisa. It's not like I got a whole lot of work to do to make Andy great. I just got to make sure we capture it. So there's some things I learned along the way and sitting down with Barry gave me an opportunity to have them sort of, you know, his opinion on what he would do, how he would envision a backdrop, how he would handle the lighting, how he would handle the length, how, he, you know, things like that. And it's stuff I hadn't always thought about, right? The way he's explaining what he would do with a backdrop and why there's distance necessary between the comic and this or how, how he would have gone about directing the actual comedy, how he would have pulled Andy out to, you know, and there's things that weirdly I, I sit here and say, I fundamentally disagreed with. Um, it, it's, and that sounds like an egocentric thing to say when you're on the other end of a table with someone like Barry Katz. But one of the things, for instance, was he said he would knock, he would do a 30 minute edit and try to and sell that in a different way. And my, my rebuttal on that was we didn't do this to sell a half hour special. We did this to record Andy's legacy, right? I'm trying to show Andy Huggins at his best in his entirety. And cutting out 20 minutes of his comedy seems like anti it seems like it's opposite what you want to achieve by putting someone's life's work out there. So I opted not to do the 30 minutes. I opted to keep it at the 51 minute mark. Um, the cool part is we just landed distribution on it. Literally signed the contract this nice. morning. Um, so it's it's gonna be everywhere. Um, oh, everywhere, everywhere. It's Comedy Dynamics took it. Oh, hell so yeah, still. it's hell yeah. it's gonna go in all the spots. You'll be able to. It's exactly what we were angling for. Uh, can proudly announce that now. This is the first time I've said it. I'm um, saying breaking news breaking right now. News. <laughs> breaking <laughs> news. <laughs> breaking news. So yeah, it's a huge win, but it's also the trying to sit down and just figure out. You know, from the comedy production standpoint, from a directorial standpoint, what am I trying to make? And I think we get so caught up in this, what is everyone trying to, what, what are they buying? What do people want? What are they, we ask that question all the time instead of asking ourselves, man, what is it you're trying to make? Hey, and with us, he'd be like, "What's the TikTok algorithm doing this but, morning?" But see, <laughs> but see, that's but it's just like what you said yeah. with, with him having a disagreement with Barry Katz. See, because I'm in the spot where I'm, I'm like trying to learn everything and kind of figure out everything, but I also want to create in a way that's like that that's like your model, like is your comedy your type of thing? Like this is mm -hmm. your style, this is your voice type of thing. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes you got to get into like you get into the muddy water of like, am I overthinking sales? Or am I overthinking the 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 sales point and stuff? And sometimes that'll come up, but it's, sometimes you got to abandon the sales part. 
to get the art part and i think that's where you're coming from and barry's coming from like you know we gotta we gotta make sure we sell this as this. we gotta market it as this mm -hmm. and i think if you're not having those conversations and you're not really thinking about that you might not care about what you're doing you know what i mean you, you gotta you, have those conversations i think they're they're both important yeah. i i i'm, they I'm are. Yeah, yeah. it's I'm lying if I say I don't think about the business side, right? Yeah. I got bills to pay. I'm trying yeah. to I'm trying to be this dude up here. I want to be top of the Yeah, relying and giving out lights for free. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm I'm trying to be that. Yeah. But I also can't it, it, when it comes to prioritization, when it comes to what I think of first, when it comes to what I decide I'm going to make, the of the two critics, the 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 businessman in me and the artist in me. The businessman doesn't get to talk until the artist is done. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's how I hold my round tables. And it's you still have to pay attention to this. But yeah. when you when I look at the business side of things and I look at what I'm what I'm going to say yes to, right? And that's ultimately what it is. I look at how much time and life this is gonna take out of me if I say yes, right? That's a big one. Mm -hmm. And then two, I ultimately am trying to make the decision that's going to leave me the most latitude, right? What's going to give me the most options in the future? I don't want to say something. I want to say yes to something that's going to guarantee me that I'm going to still be doing this exact same thing in five years. I don't want to say yes to that. I don't know who I'm going to be in five years. Right. Very. I don't want to make decisions for that dude right now because I don't know what he wants. So I'm always looking at one, what is most artistic? And then two, out of that, can I parlay that into something that's going to give me multiple options, right? Mm -hmm. The Andy special, choosing to make that, very deliberate. I knew I needed to learn a bunch of stuff. If I'm on my way to my special, right? I've gotta learn some things. I can't just shoot me right now. I need someone, I wanna say someone to practice on, but someone to practice on that also is gonna be capable of, I knew Andy's project was gonna fundraise. No doubt about it. I wasn't, we weren't going to have a problem getting enough money to pull off that special. So I knew I could do it. I knew I could sit down and learn all this stuff. I knew I could put the right team together to make the special happen so that all of my blind spots were covered. And then I knew when I was done with that, look at the options it was going to give me. Financial possibility and that we could sell it or license it. It was going to give me directorial chops for the next thing I might want to do. It was going to give me the ability to do my own special in, in the way I want to do my own special. And along the way, look at the other stuff I picked up, editing and all, light, all these tools that now give me the ability to do things with the podcast I couldn't do before, with my special I couldn't do before, with just the bit or the pilot or some of this production. So all of those steps are really deliberate ones. The one I'm doing with the steps I'm thinking of with the with my special are what it's going to open up in terms of I'm not going to be locked into anything else by that special. So it limits me none, but it gives me the potential to break it up into shorts and now push a YouTube channel that might monetize to put these things on Facebook that might monetize. More importantly, some of this could go viral and catalyze a following that now puts asses in seats, which is ultimately what I really care about is how do I fill up a room, not over five days at a full week at a club, but how do I go in on a Thursday and put five days worth of people in there once and now I'm back home. So all of those things I'm looking in terms of what options does this open up for me and that's that's the best way I know to live at the moment. So as you're thinking through decisions this and that, you go, "Man, what do I want to make and is this going to give me three other options when I'm done with it?" Because that's all you should care about. How many doors are going to open up? That's yeah. it.